Hello everybody, I am here in person for NVIDIA's GTC event and I'm sure many of you saw yesterday that Jensen Huang, the CEO of NVIDIA, announced a new set of essentially supercomputers with enough processing power to more or less kickstart the next industrial revolution as Jensen Huang points out. Now before I dive in any deeper, I do want to mention that you guys have the chance to win an RTX 4080 Super. I am working with NVIDIA on this, everything is linked down below. All you have to do is attend a free NVIDIA video GTC virtual event and you could get entered to win one of these bad boys. So yeah, there's a video on how all that is going to work linked down below. Anyways, back to Mr. Jensen and his incredible new supercomputers. I was there in person. Energy was absolutely electric. You could see it was just packed to the gills. I mean, people lining up hours before the announcement. He announced the Blackwell GPU, as I'm sure many of you have heard at this point. The compute performance is just off the charts. Multiple times what we saw with previous AI compute. And it might seem boring boring, like, yeah, GPUs, whatever, 2x times, 2.5x times, 5 times this, 5 times that. The reason you should care about this is because it powers all AI. I mean, Everybody is scrambling to get NVIDIA GPUs at this point, and not even just these brand new ones, the old ones too. Companies like Meta AI, Google, Microsoft, OpenAI, obviously, you name it. And as Jensen pointed out in his keynote, the issue is that to train larger models and more intelligent models, AGI, GPT-5, etc., we need bigger GPUs, point blank, period, and Jensen has delivered. As we see the miracle of... ChatGPT emerge in front of us, we also realize we have a long ways to go. We need even larger models. We're going to train it with multimodality data, not just text on the internet. We're going to train it on text and images and graphs and charts. There's going to be a whole bunch of watching video so that these models can be grounded in physics. Hopper is fantastic, but we need bigger GPUs. These processors are the spine, the backbone that powers all of this incredible AI software that changing our world every day. So I think as these new Blackwell GPUs begin to distribute across the AI space, we're going to see some rapid advancement, even further accelerating how good these models can be and how fast we can train them. That's one of the highlights that really stood out to me and that I really remember the most from the keynote. Jensen spoke about how long it took to train GPT-4 and noted with Blackwell, you can do so for way cheaper in terms of electricity cost. This also means with the same electricity cost, you can train them that much faster or train that much bigger models. And the GPUs that will actually make it possible for us users at home to have capabilities such as Sora for reasonable prices. And of course also enable the open source variants of Sora that are surely coming down the line. So as boring as this hardware can be, I think you have to realize that NVIDIA produced this in two years time and they absolutely see AI as the future. So if you want to see more advanced AI technology, if you want to see AI technology that is orders of magnitude greater than anything we could possibly even imagine, then get excited because NVIDIA is definitely down to essentially power it, be that backbone for that future. Now, Jensen also spoke a lot about software. He spoke about something called a NIM, essentially a highly customizable microservice to easily integrate AI into whatever business you're trying to create more or less. Invent a new way for you to receive and operate software, and we call it the NVIDIA Inference Microservice, a NIM. It's a pre-trained model, so it's pretty clever. You have all these pre-trained, state-of-the-art open source models. They could be open source, they could be from one of our partners, it could be created by us, like NVIDIA Moment. It is packaged up with all of its dependencies. So CUDA, the right version, CUDNN, the right version, Tensor RT, LLM, distributing across the multiple GPUs. Absolutely has this massive capability to accelerate the industry further, giving businesses the capability to just plop AI in without, you know, trying to fine tune it on their own data themselves, etc. It can all be done in their very simple service. Jensen also spoke about his Omniverse, and it seems like he really believes the future of product development is to actually simulate the product fully inside of a computer before it's then built and turned into reality. And he calls these digital twins. And they can be so advanced as to even be an entire warehouse floor, for example. Not just, for example, simulating a, an entire car. What I really found intriguing is it seems like a lot of people don't agree with Jensen on this whole digital twins idea. They really feel as though maybe it's not that simple to simulate the real world. And people noted 
particular use cases such as medical, where you can't, you know, have a simulated digital twin based robot operating on a human because that, you know, 0.01% when it actually does fail because something unexpected happens, the robot doesn't know what to do. Jensen's counter argument to that really does seem to be, well, we'll use AI to solve that problem because AI has the ability to generalize solutions. How these things actually work in reality remain to be seen, but I definitely don't disagree with the idea that simulations could be incredibly valuable. I just don't know if it'll be a one-size-fits-all solution for every single problem out there. Now, other than that, guys, I did get the chance to attend a Q&A with Jensen, which was a little bit more personal on the press could ask questions. From this Q&A, it really appears evident to me that Jensen knows what the hell he's talking about when it comes to AI technologies. He knows the specifics and he knows how it all works under the hood and he understands where the value is. In my interpretation of the keynote, Jensen's conclusion on where AI technology is headed really appears to be that it is absolutely life-changing technology and it has the power for tremendous benefit. A reporter even asked him about AGI and whether it was something that he was afraid of or not. And what's really interesting is Jensen actually brought up a point that I consistently hit on on this channel, which is how do we even define AGI in the first place? Because it seems like everyone has their own different definition of AGI right now. Jensen classified AGI as a series of tests from every single major field that the AI can complete with high accuracy and better than most humans. So artificial general intelligence. And I think that's a pretty fair way to go about describing AGI. He didn't answer whether or not it scared him, but I would think that it probably does not. He's very optimistic about AI's capability, and honestly, he's pretty gung-ho on open source as well. NVIDIA does actually have a pretty decent track record of open sourcing some software. Fellow AI creator Billowall also had the opportunity to ask Jensen, how far are we from a world where every pixel is generated at real-time frame rates? Because, of course, as Jensen keeps pointing out, both in the keynote and the Q&A today, we're slowly moving away from a digital world that retrieves everything from a server, and slowly moving to a world that generates everything in real time. The way that computing has done in the past was retrieval. There's pre-recorded content. Somebody wrote a story or somebody made an image or somebody recorded a video. Pre-recorded content is then streamed back to the phone. In the future, the vast majority of that content will not be retrieved. And the reason for that is because that was pre-recorded by somebody who doesn't understand the context, which is the reason why we have to retrieve so much content. If you can be working with an AI that understands the context, who you are, for what reason you're fetching this information, and produces the information for you just the way you like it. The amount of energy we save, the amount of networking bandwidth we save will be tremendous. The future is generative, which is the reason why we call it generative AI. Jensen estimates that we are about five to eight years away from a reality where all of our digital consumption is generated in real time. So you have to wonder how much further is he going to take AI compute? Because even with these new Blackwell GPUs, I don't see us anywhere close to that. But I have consistently been blown away by AI's rapid progress. And let's be honest, Jensen probably has a better idea of this thing than me. Considering he's the man again making the backbone for this entire brand new industry. So again, if you thought that AI was slowing down in any way, shape, or form, industry leaders would heavily disagree. I gotta say, though, my experience at GTC so far has been pretty awesome. If you follow me on Twitter or, or joined in my Discord server, which you should absolutely join, by the way, you'll see I've been hanging out with other AI creators, Matt Wolf, Igor, aka the AI Advantage, Billowall. Also got to meet Pete and Alex, and so far it's just been awesome. Already learning so much by talking to and chatting with other creators, and hopefully you'll see some collaborations between all of us at some point in the future. One other piece of NVIDIA news that I did want to touch on is their extreme focus on robotics. They're working on simulating humanoid robots for walking, grabbing, doing all kinds of things. And they're working with like an absolute plethora of companies to do this. So it's not like OpenAI's case where it's one robotics company they're working with. Just off this one Twitter post I'm looking at, we can see eight 
plus robotics companies that they're working with to simulate humanoid robots. And Jensen even brought some cute little robots on stage and ended the keynote with that. AI robotics is heating up and it is on its way full steam ahead. We did in fact hit the NVIDIA showroom floor at GTC to see if we could find anything cool and for the most part it was just developer stuff. Nothing too exciting for the general AI enthusiast. We did try a few demos and I am going to head back out there to see if there's anything I can find. But more or less the number one thing I've learned is that people in this AI creator space are awesome. So I wanted to just touch on and talk a little bit about Grok being open source. I know it's probably old news by now. So with Grok's release, it actually surprised everybody. They did include the weights. It's a torrent download, a massive one, hundreds of gigabytes in size. So this is definitely not something you're going to run on your local computer at home. It's a 314 billion parameter mixture of experts model with 25 percent of those parameters active at any given time in order to facilitate answers. What's cool is they released it as a base model so it's not fine-tuned for any particular task which really does allow you to fine-tune it for whatever task you're looking to accomplish. So that was pretty cool and yes it is you know fully ready for commercial uses. It's, it's open source in the good kind of way which made everyone pretty happy but I think a lot of people were shocked to see just how big the model was for how little performance you really got out of it. Again, it's maybe competitive with GPT 3.5, not even, and it's probably quite a bit bigger. A big, heavy, bulky model. And Matt was quick to point out, though, on Twitter that, yes, that might all be true. However, let's cut him some slack here. How good was your first model? He thinks that for XAI's first AI model, it's actually quite impressive. So it's really all perspective based here. I'm really happy they did open source it in the correct way. Nice and open for everyone to access, but since it is so big and bulky, well, it's just not that usable for a lot of smaller developers or companies. However, some people have been quantizing Grok in an attempt to make it run on any local computer. So we'll see how that turns out. Anyways, you probably saw this as well. Apparently, Apple is in talks with Google and some other companies trying to find uh, a large language model to probably power their next iteration of Siri. And I think the main takeaway is like, yeah, I don't think that Apple would necessarily release a bad AI product, even if they're in talks with Google about using Google's AI. They're not just going to release a bad Google AI into the wild for people to use. They're going to make sure that it's competitive. It's just the way Apple has always been. But a lot of people believe that Apple was asleep at the wheel and that they have the resources to be developed developing AI of their own, so why aren't they? Well, a point that I've seen made so far is that, while well, they don't have to right now, they can sit back and kind of wait it out and slowly develop their own AI in the background. In a similar vein, they used Intel CPUs in a lot of their laptops for years, and when the time was right, they developed their own Apple M1 chips. So people think it's going to be like a similar scenario. Let me know how you guys feel about that down in the comments below, but it's interesting. I would have thought that Apple Apple was really trying to push out their own model. Stability AI also went ahead and released something called Stable Video 3D. More or less, you can give it a single image of any object, and the model has the capability to actually output views of that object from any theoretical angle. You can then use all of those novel view angles to develop a 3D mesh of the object. I would say the quality of this model is decent, but nowhere near the level of usable for everyday projects. You have to have a stability AI membership if you want to use it for commercial purposes, and for non-commercial purposes, it's free to download and use as open source. So in comparison to Grok, let's say this is a little bit more of a sad open source release. Yes, technically it is open source. It is good for the community, but not as good as a full commercial do-whatever-you-want style open source release. Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, was also recently interviewed by Lex Friedman. Lots of interesting insights as a whole. I'll link the podcast down below. Some of the highlights that I have found on Twitter, though, are things like this. They are going to release a model this year, and I think that's quite obvious. They still don't have a name for it, and apparently over the next coming month, they're going to release many different things, not just one amazing model. Apparently, before they release GPD-5, they have a lot of other important things to release 
first. So leaves you wondering what are they working on in the background? Well, either way, it gets me excited for the near future, at least for 2024 in regards to AI and open AI. It is just overall good stuff to hear. I'm going to link Andrew Caron's thread down below because he has a bunch of other great quotes from the interview. Definitely take a peek if you're interested on where open AI is headed in a very vague way because Sam Altman doesn't really give a lot of definite answers. It seems like he doesn't want to talk too much about it. He wants to keep us all mystified. Microsoft is continually building their AI forces, hiring Mustafa Suleiman. He's joining Microsoft as the CEO of Microsoft AI, which I assume is going to be a separate division of Microsoft entirely. He'll be leading all consumer AI products and research like Copilot, Bing, Edge, etc. And he left Inflection AI because he was previously Inflection AI's CEO. And Inflection AI, if you didn't already know, they're working on Pi, which is a pretty awesome interface for interacting with a large language model. Very natural feeling, and it feels very much like the future of interaction with large language models, more or less. Suhail points out on Twitter that this is a part of Microsoft's AI plan here. They want to become an AI powerhouse like OpenAI, for example. They are going to be doing their own research. They're going to create their own models and they're going to create their own AI products, not just use OpenAIs, although they are for the time being. So it's going to be a long road ahead. And I think Microsoft's going to be a larger competitor as we start to see releases from them. You have to wonder though, are any of them going to be open source? releases because I definitely would like to see that from them. If I had to guess, probably not, but at least we can trust Meta to stay consistent on that level and give us a nice, hopefully, open source Llama 3 sometime soon. Again, I'm still at GTC. It's not over yet, and you still have a chance to win an RTX 4080 Super, so go check that out down in the description below. And of course, don't forget to check out the Discord server, which is just a phenomenal community on there, truthfully. Really one of the main ways I stay up to date in the world of AI. But yeah, I am, of course, in a hotel room right now, so sorry for any visual or audio quality differences. See you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.